Well, I want to take just a moment and to remind you next week, we begin a new series that leads us into the Easter season called Encountering Easter. It's going to be a five-week series where we look at people who, if you remember in Scripture, nobody told them it was the first Easter. Now, some of them should have known because if you read what Jesus says in the Gospels, in the lead-up to his dying on the cross, he flat-out tells his disciples, listen, the Son of Man is going to be delivered over into the hands of wicked people. They're going to crucify him, kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. He flat-out tells them that before it happens, but nonetheless, they didn't understand or didn't believe, and Easter caught them by surprise. So we're going to see some people who encountered Easter and how it changed their lives and how it can change your life as well. So plan to join us all five weeks of that series, which leads into and actually goes beyond our Easter season. Now I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me one last time this morning to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 24, and we are concluding this series in this daring, this dynamic book of Joshua, and we've titled the series Crossing Over, How to Get from Where You Are to Where God Wants You to Be. And if you'll remember, way back at the beginning of this series, I told you this, I said, God has given you the victory. And if you are not living a victorious life, you are living beneath your privileges. That's what this series and this study has been all about. The book of Joshua was written to show us how we can have victory, the victory that God wants us to have, not just super saints, not just Christians, or, or not just super Christians, not just pastors, but all of us, every single one of us who knows Jesus as our Savior, God has victory he wants to give to us. God has promised it. He has provided it, but now you have to go in and possess it. The victorious Christian life is not your responsibility. I want to alleviate you of that concern in your life that you say how am I ever going to live this life it is not your responsibility it is your response to his ability in your life victory isn't an element of the Christian life it is the very essence of the Christian life so to make it even simpler as a Christian you don't have to live the Christian life what you need to do is allow Jesus to live his life through you. You say, well, what does that look like? What does that look like when I go to work? What does that look like when I'm having an argument with my spouse? What that looks like is you simply say to Jesus, Jesus, I don't know what to do here. Will you help me to do what I need to do to be victorious? And when you do that, that's when you begin to experience and enjoy what's known as the victorious Christian life. Now, this morning, we come to the last chapter of the book of Joshua. And as we do, we find Joshua nearing the end. He's coming to the end of his life and his ministry. If you'll remember, Moses brought them out of Egypt. Joshua brought them into the promised land. That's the recurring theme of this book over and over. Possessing our possessions. Being what God's called us to be. Grabbing hold of everything that he's given to us. Now, for the past number of years, Joshua and the children of Israel. They've been conquering their enemies. They've been going in and possessing the land, but there are still enemies to conquer, and there's still land to be possessed. They've accomplished a great deal, but they haven't completely finished what God set them out to do when they came into Canaan. They've done a great deal. They've won many battles. They've conquered many cities. They've overcome many obstacles. They've achieved many different things, but now God speaks to them through his servant, Joshua and he gives them the greatest challenge yet. I want you to look Joshua chapter 24 look at verses 1 and 2 then we're going to skip down to verse 14. Verse 1 it says Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem and summoned Israel's elders leaders judges and officers and they presented themselves before God. 
Joshua said to all the people, now skip down to verse 14 for his message. Therefore, fear the Lord and worship him in sincerity and truth. Get rid of the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and worship the Lord. But if it doesn't please you to worship the Lord, choose for yourselves today the one you will worship, the gods your fathers worshipped beyond the Euphrates River or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my family, we will worship the Lord. Now that God's spoken to us through his word, let's speak with him in prayer. Father, today we see Joshua's encouraging message. Lord, we see his honest message that says, if you're not going to worship in this fashion, then I tell you to go find something to worship. But if you're going to be sold out for the Lord, you need to worship the Lord. So, Lord, I pray you would help us to see today a very realistic picture of what it means to go on for God. In Jesus' name, amen. God, in essence, is saying to them here, I want you to be all that you can be. I want you to accomplish all that you can accomplish. I don't want you to settle. I don't want you to sit down. I don't want you to stop. I want you to go on for me and with me. Now, remember... They've done a whole lot here. It would have been really easy for them to say, we're tired. Man, we've fought so many fights. We've done so much. We've claimed a lot of ground. We've met our goals. We've seen a lot of our dreams become reality. We're going to settle down. We're going to stay right here. We're going to be comfortable. You know, there's some more Canaanites in the land over here or over there. That's okay. We'll just leave them there. We've done enough. It's time for us to take it easy and enjoy life. They could have said that. But God speaks to them through Joshua and issues this challenge to resist the temptation to relax, to sit back on past victories, and to rest in the memories. And I believe that that is a vital message for Faith Baptist Church today. God has blessed us. God has provided for us. God has strengthened us. God has allowed us to see people come to faith in him, to see people be baptized into this body, to see other people join this body, and then sent out to serve in his name. And as a result of that, it would be really easy for us to get to the point where we say, you know what, God provides for us and God just takes care of us. It's comfortable. Let's just sit down and let's enjoy what God has done. That's the decision before us. Are we going to sit down? Are we going to settle? Are we going to say, oh, you know what? Children's ministry is going good. Oh, you know what? Student ministry is going good. Oh, you know what? Worship services are going good. This is going good. I'm just going to settle down and enjoy. Or are we going to get up? get going, and continue to claim all the possessions that God has promised us. Folks, it is so easy to stop short of what God really wants to do in us and through us. It's easy for us to say to the Lord, maybe you can even do it in your personal life. You know what? God's blessed me in my personal life. God's helped me in my job. I'm in a good place now. He's strengthened me. He's prospered me. There's still more that he wants me to do. Yeah, but I like it here. I just like where I'm at in life. This is comfortable, it's nice, it's good. Is that the way you get sometimes in your Christian life? I get that way sometimes. There are those times when I've been growing and stretching and climbing and I finally get to the top of the mountain and I think that it is the apex. But in reality, it's a plateau. And when I get there, it's so tempting to say, you know what, I like this. This is comfortable. I can hang out here. My wife and I, my, our family, we went to the uh, Smoky Mountains this past week. And when you're hiking trails, that sort of thing can happen. When you go up on a trail, you get up to a point and you'll reach an area where that trail flattens out. And it is so easy as you're walking in that area where that trail has flattened out 
you then look and you see an upward grade again. It's easy to say, hey, you know what? This is kind of nice right here. Maybe we'll just stay here. Or maybe we'll just go back to the car and say, hey, we've seen this part of it. But if you keep going, you reach something amazing. Folks, that's where the average Christian and the average church is today. Comfortable. They have made a choice to stay right where they are at and not go any further. That's when God comes to us like he did through Joshua in chapter 24 and says, you can't stay here. Don't sit back in your satisfaction. Don't settle for just being mediocre. There's so much more that I want to do in you and through you. And I believe that this morning's message is a challenge for Christians today who maybe you've reached a plateau. You're satisfied in your position. You're settled in your place. And you're stagnant in your progress. Now, I know you're thinking the same thoughts that sometimes I think. You're thinking, you know what? I'm better than most. I'm more faithful than most. Yeah, you go get them, preacher. You preach at those people who are comfortable. You know, I'm serving more than he is. I'm serving more than she is. I've done my part. I've done my share. I've given my best. It's time to let somebody else take over, and I'll just sit down and stay right here. You know what God's saying to you this morning? He's saying, get up, get with it, get going. There's a whole lot more I want to do through you, and there's a whole lot more I want to do in you, too. So let me show you real quickly this morning how we ought to be, as we close out this book, going on for God. I want you to see three simple things today. First of all, I want you to see you need to trust God. God says you can trust me. Why? Why do we trust God? He gives us two very practical, very personal reasons. First of all, we trust God because he's prospered us, because of what he's given to us. We can trust God because of his provision. I want you to look back at verse 13. Here's what the text says. He says, I've given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you didn't plant. God says, I've given you all this stuff and you didn't build any of them. You know, it's interesting. Several years ago, Barack Obama, when he was president, got in trouble for making a statement when he was talking about a business. He said, if you have a business, you didn't build that. And people pulled back against that and not saying anything about his particular statement, but looking at this statement, that was entirely accurate. These people walked into houses they did not build. They walked into groves. They walked into crops that they didn't plant. They walked into a land that they didn't labor for. God went before them. He gave them land. Land represents wealth. It represents prosperity. It represents the tangible, material, physical blessings of God. So they had land to graze on. They had land to build on. They had houses to live in as a result of God's provision, as a result of his prospering. Every family that was faithful went on into the promised land, and they had a lot, a spot, and a place to call home. That was a big deal. For people who had wandered around in the wilderness and had no home, now they had a home. They had a house. God said to them, I want you to go on to be all that I have called you to be based on what I have given you. Has God prospered you individually? Absolutely. Has God prospered Faith Baptist Church? Absolutely. God's given us houses to live in. He's given us cars to drive. He's given us clothes to wear. He's given us food to eat. Now, folks, make sure you understand what I just said. We don't have, a lot of us, a car. We have cars. We don't have a TV. We have TVs. We don't have 
some food. We have more food than we can even eat. I remember when I was growing up, it was the time when there was a lot of famine that was uh, going on in Africa at that time. And my mother would say, very much like probably a lot of your moms would say, there are starving kids in Africa who would love to have this food. I remember thinking, ship it off and give it to them then. Come on. But we're blessed. We're a blessed people. So why should we be hesitant to go on for God when he's already blessed us and given us so much amazing abundance so far? It's like we believe if we go on for God, he's going to take it all away. There's not a need we have that he hasn't met. That's why we can say with Paul, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God has provided for us. God has provided for this church. God has given us a beautiful facility to meet in. God has given us wonderful workers who even now are ministering to your babies and to your children God has given to us student ministry. God has given to us music ministry. God has given to us people who are skilled and are able to take care of problems and challenges that come up at Faith Baptist Church. We were just talking in Sunday school today. I don't know if you saw when you came in, right over on this side of the building, you see that there's a few holes right there. Well, we had a water leak But we have men who are skilled at being able to find and determine something that a plumber or somebody like that would have charged a generous amount of money to get in there and to fix. But God has given to us people who are helpful like that. God's provided for us as a church in so many ways because of how he's prospered us but also because of how he's protected us. What does that verse say again? Let's go back to that. It says, I've given you a land for which you did not labor, cities which you didn't build, and you dwell in them. That speaks of protection. That talks to us about God's protective hand. Those cities were to protect their people from the attacks of the enemy. God has protected us, folks. God's protected your family. Think back over the past year. Think back about how many things and how many times something has happened that could have absolutely destroyed your family. But God protected you. God did the same thing for you that he did for Job. Now, it's interesting. I will sometimes uh, joke and talk about that phrase, hedge of protection, because it gets used a lot in church circles. But that's actually a biblical phrase talking about Job, that he put a hedge of protection around him. And he told the devil, this you can go to, but that's as far as you can go. Folks, God has protected this church family. There are many things that could have torn this church family apart and could have ruined the witness of this church in this community for years and years to come. But God has protected us. God has prospered us. God has provided for us. And so God says, based on all of that, why shouldn't you go on for me? He says to trust him. Secondly, we should also fear God. Fear God. Look at verse 14. It says, therefore, fear the Lord and worship him in sincerity and truth. Get rid of the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and worship the Lord. Worship God. That's actually what that word fear means right there. It's a Hebrew word, yarfi, and it means to worship. It is sometimes translated worship in your Old Testament. It means that your number one top priority first and foremost thing in your life ought to be to worship God. Let me tell you what real worship will do in your life. Not the worship 
where you come here and you although it's very important to come here and worship God where you come here and worship God and then you leave and you leave that worship here and then you come back to it the next week what does it mean when you really worship God with your life when you really begin to live a life of worship it means your focus is going to be on the Lord. Your walk is going to be different as a result. Your drive to work will be different. Your day at work will be different. Your lunch hour will be different. Your interactions with your spouse will be different. Your interactions with interruptions in your life will be different. We need to learn what it really means to praise the Lord, to magnify the Lord, to adore the Lord, to love the Lord. We need to live a life that is marked by fitting with him. Because when you have been with Jesus, when you worship the way Joshua was talking about, people are going to know it. People are going to see something different in your life. And it creates such a great opportunity to tell people about Jesus. What does the Bible say? It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Remember, one of our core values is a lifestyle of worship, not just a Sunday experience, not just coming to get something here and then going and living your life however you want to after that. We will never be all that God wants us to be until we really love him with all of our being, heart, soul, mind, strength, all of it have you stopped and considered how god must view the average attender at a worship service all across the country right now there are people meeting in worship services it must break god's heart to see people take this time and fumble through their facebook page and their twitter page it must break God's heart to see people thinking through their grocery list or what kind of meetings they're going to have tomorrow or focused on what they're going to eat for lunch here in a little while. It must break God's heart to see all of that when his son is being worshipped and his word is being preached. We can't even begin to do what God has called us to do until we are being who God has called us to be until we lay our head on the chest of Jesus and feel his heartbeat, because then, because only then do we understand what it means to really worship him. And then we can work the way he wants us to. What does the text say? Therefore, fear the Lord and worship him in sincerity, and in truth so as believers we're to serve the lord as christians we serve jesus the outgrowth of being who he wants us to be is doing what he wants us to do he's the head he's the head of his church so we're supposed to be his hands we're supposed to be his feet his arms his legs his mouth speaking for him we are to serve him I'll tell you this, one of the challenges of pastoring in 21st century America is this idea of a consumerist, selfish, me kind of society to get church members to grasp the concept of serving other people in the midst of that. But that's what we're here to do. We're here to serve the Lord. We're here to serve one another. We're here to serve people who are lost. And it will take work. I talk to the staff sometimes and I tell them there is a reason it's called church work. It is work. And it takes work. It takes hard work to build an evangelistic, soul-winning, gospel-focused church. That's why this afternoon at 4 o'clock, we're going to be here, and we're going to go out in this neighborhood and other neighborhoods, and we're going to canvas this neighborhood telling people about Jesus because it takes work if you're going to see that happen. That's our job as followers of Jesus because we follow the one who was and who still is a worker. What does he say? He says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it's still day. 
because night is coming when no one can work. Jesus said, I have a finite period of time on this planet to do what God has called me to do, and I need to make sure that I do it because the day is coming when I can no longer do it, at least on this planet, in physical form. Jesus was a carpenter before power tools and before drills, electric drills, electric saws. He knew what it was like to work. He knew what it was like to sweat. You know, it's funny. Um, occasionally, I will have opportunity to be around uh, uh, a couple of other pastors in conversation. And sometimes during the course of that conversation, the conversation works its way around to Sunday night church. And they'll still say, y'all still have church on Sunday night, don't you? And I say, yeah. And they say, I don't see how you do it. They talk about how hard it is to get people to come back, how hard it is to prepare two sermons, how hard it is to spend a large chunk of time at the church on that particular day. And, you know, I listen and I nod and I smile in my head. I want to say, quit being such a crybaby. Come on. No wonder the world is dying and going to hell, folks. Even people who are called by God to be pastors are afraid of a little bit of work. Now, I know it is harder than it used to be. It is harder for us to get people to sign up and to serve in other capacities around church. It's more and more challenging. It is. People in the pews have time for anything and everything sometimes except the Lord and his church. But I will say this, you are never going to make the difference in this world that God has called you to make until you get plugged in serving how he wants you to serve. Now, many, many, many of you are already doing that. There are some of you who, because of health constraints, you are a prayer warrior and you intercede for this church in prayer in some dynamic ways. And we praise the Lord for that. But we've been called to worship. We've been called to work. We've also been called to witness. What does it say, Joshua 24? Look at verse 14, the last part of it. Get rid of the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and worship the Lord. Folks, there's a powerful witness in a pure life. There's a powerful witness in jettisoning stuff that will keep you from a right relationship with God. What does that tell me? That tells me that the people, make sure you understand this, the people who sat at the foot of Mount Sinai and saw the th and heard the thunder and saw the lightning and were scared out of their minds when Moses came down and for 40 days his face shone. The people who God harnessed the forces of nature to provide them with Food. The people who God uh, had Moses speak to a rock, and then he struck it when he wasn't supposed to, and water came out of it, and they drank that water. The people who for 40 years never had to change their shoes. Can you imagine wandering in the wilderness for 40 years on a quarter-inch shoe strap of leather and it never wearing out? God provided for them in some amazing ways, and for 40 years, they had brought and cultivated some little idol gods that had come from beyond the Euphrates River. Wow. How sad. God tells them, Joshua tells them, it's time for choosing. Joshua says, you need to get rid of all that stuff that you've carried with you for years and years, and you need to serve the Lord. You need to worship the Lord. I am convinced that one of the greatest needs in the church today is a revival of holiness. Folks, if we're basing our salvation on something that doesn't make us walk differently than the rest of the world, talk differently than the rest of the world, live differently than the rest of the world, if it doesn't cause you to put away the gods of this world and to serve the God of the universe with a pure heart, then I don't know what you got, but I don't think it was the real thing. The Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Christian, God is saying to you this morning, I want you to be everything I have created you to be. I want you to do all that I've called you to do. Don't settle for what you have. Don't settle for where you are. Don't settle for comfortability. Don't be satisfied with what you've accomplished. Trust God. Fear God. Third thing, he says to serve God. Serve God. Look at verse 15. But if it doesn't please you to worship the Lord... Choose for yourselves today the one you will worship. The gods your fathers worshipped beyond the Euphrates River or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. As for me and my family, we will worship the Lord. If we're going to be victorious, if we're going to get from where we are to where God wants us to be, if we're going to truly be what God created us to be and do all that he created us to do, then there is a decision we have to make. Are you going to serve God or not? Here in Joshua 24, Joshua gives the children of Israel multiple choice. He gives them three different options and says, pick one. Color in the bubble with the right one. He says, you can serve the gods that your father served on the other side of the Euphrates. That's tradition. You can serve the gods of this world that you live in, the people who are around you. That's culture. Or you can serve the Lord. You can serve Yahweh. Tradition. That's where a lot of churches land. There are churches in America that think the roof would fall in if you don't sing the doxology every Sunday. There are churches that think that you violated some kind of a sacred scriptural teaching if the service ever goes past 12 noon. And that's really where the problem is. Too many churches, they conflate human tradition and even what they like with the teaching of God's word and they want to put those on par with each other. It is important to know who you are worshiping. You know, people leave churches en masse in America for all kinds of different reasons. There are people who leave churches because they don't like the music. There are people who leave churches because they don't like the style of preaching. There are people who leave churches because uh, they have a greeting time or they don't have a greeting time. And those things are nice. And sometimes we like those different things or we don't like those different things. And I think the folks in here have a good grasp on that. But I've told this to the staff before and I'll tell it to you too. It is very important that you get the music that you want and only the music that you want on one condition. It is very important that you get the preaching exactly the way you want it and only the way you want it on one condition. It is very important that the programs of this church exist for you and only you on one condition. It is important for you to have the music you want and only the music you want. It is important for you to have the programs you want and only the programs you want. And it is important for you to have the preaching you want and only the preaching you want if you are the one being worshipped. If you are not then what will happen is you will come into a worship service and say, everything here is not exactly my preference. And that's a good thing. Because sometimes we're reaching a younger generation, and I, being a part of an older generation, feel a little bit uncomfortable with that, or a tension exists in that. Or maybe sometimes a younger generation says, you know what? We're reaching this older generation as well. And so, even though it's not something I'm completely comfortable with, I feel okay with that. If you're the one being worshipped, it's important for you to have exactly what you want. If not, 
it's important for all of us to say, what's going to help us reach Rowan County for the cause of Jesus? Now listen, folks, this spills over into so many areas of our lives. Listen, I'm a Baptist. I am a Southern Baptist. But the only reason I am a Southern Baptist is because that we are the denomination that most closely and most consistently follows what this book says. And I will just add this and then I'll move on. If the day comes when Southern Baptists ever stop following and preaching and proclaiming the truth of this book, that is the day I stop being a Southern Baptist. There are many, many Christians who make idols out of tradition. Culture. You can serve the gods of this world that you are in. Joshua tells them. There are a lot of Christians who are doing that. They're serving the gods of pleasure. Some of what we're talking about in Sunday school in Bible Studies for Life in Ecclesiastes. Pleasure, pride, profit, position, power, whatever it is. If God were to stand your gods up in front of you, what would you see? Would you see your net worth? Would you see your 401k? Would you see a hunting rifle, a shotgun, a bass boat? A soccer ball, a volleyball, a baseball, a child, a family member, a group of family members that you get to be around all the time? See, that's where some of you might be this morning. You've gotten caught up in the things of this world and you are serving what Joshua equates to the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're currently living. What would it be like if your gods were shown on parade? Or you can serve the Lord. That's what Joshua said. He said, I don't know about you guys, but I know what I'm going to do, and I know what my family is going to do. We're going to worship the Lord. It was a decision that Joshua had thought out very well. It was a deliberate decision. It was personal. He said, I have made a deliberate choice to do this. Something he had thought through. Have you ever done that? Have you ever thought through what a life with Jesus is going to look like for the long haul and said, yeah, I'm willing to buy into that? It was a deliberate decision. It was also a determined decision, though. No matter what anybody else does, no matter what anybody else does, doesn't do if nobody else around me does it i'm going to keep doing it and if god lets me live to be 95 i'm going to keep doing it no matter what anybody else does it's a determined decision that he made and it was a decisive decision it's interesting when it says right there in the hebrew text choose this day whom you will serve. That phrase, this day, right there, literally means immediately or right now. Joshua says it is a time for choosing. It is a time to determine what God wants you to do and who he wants you to be. It is a decisive decision to make right now. Right now, it is your time for choosing. Who are you going to serve? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes.